God has a word for us today. God has a word for us today. God has a word for us today. When's the last time we got excited just about that? Just about when you got in his presence and you got in his word and you got in your prayer closet and you were excited, you just couldn't wait to hear what he was going to say to you. Come on, we get excited about a new car and a new job and a new man and a new girl and some new shoes. But do we get excited when we think God's about to say something to me? Come on. We need truth. We need the truth. So y'all going to pay attention and you're going to participate today? Because truth is truth no matter where it comes from. And pastor's not here, but truth is truth even if it comes through a jack donkey. A jack donkey, I said. My wife got on to me for last time. I'm going to say it one more time. God's got a word for us. Now make it personal. God's got a word for me. We'll give you an analogy, a football analogy. Everybody's familiar with football. Pretty much, most everybody knows the sport. Well, in football, they have what's called a quarterback on the offense. And that quarterback occasionally will throw the ball downfield to advance the ball. There's another player on that team called a receiver. Now I want you to picture the quarterback throwing a beautiful spiral right on the money. And just as the ball gets there, the receiver goes... and watches the ball hit the ground. Wouldn't that be terrible? The Holy Spirit is going to throw you the football. It is your job to catch it. Will you receive the word? Are you watching the quarterback? Somebody asked me before church, Are you preaching? I said, I hope not. If if I'm preaching, we're wasting some good time. We could all be at the lake. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit will speak through me and he'll do the preaching. Before I go any further, I'm just, I got a word for somebody. I don't even know who this is for. In your vehicle, on your dashboard, there right beside the, your speed, there's another, what do you call them, instrument. It's called RPMs. Thank you. RPM stand for revolutions per minute. Revolutions per minute. If you 
ever drive a stick, you have to push the clutch in, let it out. But an automatic will do the same thing if you drop it down in low. You got drive two and one. If you put it in first gear and you give it the gas and you start going and you leave it in first, your RPM will begin to go up. And it'll keep going. And if you just keep it in that gear, your RPMs will do what they call red line. That means that's not good. And either your transmission is going to explode or your engine is going to explode if you redline it. But when you go from first to second, the RPMs drop. It's not putting as much stress on the engine, but you're going faster and getting where you want to go quicker. And God said, somebody needs to shift gears. Because you got saved, but you're leaving it in first. And you're about to blow the engine because you're trying to do this on your own. And God is saying, shift gears. If you'll just shift gears, you'll find that it's less stress on the engine. But you'll go faster and further if you'll just shift gears. Don't redline. Whoever that was for. I do have notes. I have pen and paper, and I will be taking names. To hand to Pastor Steve when he returns... Pastor Steve, Corey was on TikTok. Daniel did not lift his hands during worship. So we're going to have to participate today. The title of my message is The Purpose or Why of Praise. The Purpose or Why of Praise. Have you ever noticed either a pastor, mainly a praise and worship leader, wherever you go, will encourage the people to stand up, raise your hands, sing to the Lord, enter in, why are they doing that? And I've look, I got saved when I was 30. I'm 32 right now. I'm 62. I've seen a few things. And I've seen people be upset because a pastor or a praise and worship leader why are they trying to get me? This is how I am. I'm worshiping on the inside. I'm like a ninja. Why? Are they trying to get me to do that. Oh, you are awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Huh? Hopefully I won't trip over that. Why are they trying to do that? I want you to picture something. Y'all heard this. Gosh, I'm so country. You all have heard this. If you've been in church, uh, pastors will say this. Usually it's during tithes and offerings. And they'll say, I'm not trying to get something from you. I'm trying to get something to you. Everybody heard that? Which is a very true statement. I have a little trouble with the wording, though, and I'm going to tell you why. I want you to picture a beautiful cabin. Oh, Sean, you're going to love this. 
beautiful cabin on a 10-acre lake. Ducks flying in, Sean. Big, tall, green pines everywhere. And over at the distance is a big mountain. You see snow caps on it. You see it already, don't you? That stuff. Do you know I cannot go get that picture I just painted and bring it to you? That stuff ain't changing. It ain't moving. It ain't changing. But I can get you to the stuff. But to get you to the stuff, you have to participate and come. If you're going to enjoy the view I just described to you, you're going to have to engage. I can't get that to you, but I can get you to that. And so that's my heart today, is to get us to something. Because it's going to help you. It's going to help me. So are we ready? And I like that. The definition of praise. And I just want y'all to know something too. I'm just going to go and tell on myself right now. Have y'all ever seen uh, a horse race? These people back here are probably freaking out. Am I walking too much? Am I? That, that camera's like. Have y'all ever been to the track? Don't say yes. And they have these horses and they're all behind this gate and all of a sudden you hear this gunshot and the gate's open and the horses, I mean from right there, that spot, they're wide open. It's like It ain't like they start with a little slow gallop and then they work up to it. I mean, they come out blaring. I'm having to fight doing that right now. Because I want to just come out wide open. But I can't. So. The definition of praise express warm approval or admiration of something. I'm going to use that in a sentence. We can't praise Chris enough. He did a brilliant job. I'm going to read that sentence again, but I'm going to add a T on Chris's name. We can't praise Christ enough. He did a brilliant job. Mm. Praise in the Bible simply means obedience. I'm going to put out a couple a few other words to just kind of tie into praise. Bless, exalt, extol, glorify, magnify, thank, and confess. To praise God is to call attention to his glory. Because we know the word says that if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men nine to me. When we come in here and we praise... Do we believe God will do what he said? He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto myself. It's our job to do the lifting. It's not our job to do the drawing. Well, I'm not educated and I'm not have a gift and I, I'm not this and I'm not that. There's all these excuses why we don't praise. But praise is obedience. And we're going to see that in the Word in a minute. We're going to see that the Word does not say praise if you feel like it. Come on, you said you wanted to real. We're going to get real. It doesn't say praise if you feel like it. It doesn't say praise if everything's good with you. It doesn't say praise if everything's bad with you. 
because whatever's going on in your life and my life, God still deserves praise. He is the only one worthy in this house that's worthy of praise. Let's, let's go to the Word. There are a few things that the Lord put on my heart uh, concerning praise. And, and when I was writing my notes uh, that I need to learn to start typing because I can't read my writing. But when I was writing my notes the, the worship set today was nowhere in my thoughts but God is trying to say something to us because we just sang about it this morning what he told me to pin down in my notes concerning praise we're talking about praise The first thing I want you to know, if you are a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, y'all y'all want real? Because some of you looking at me like, dude. Praise is not optional. Come on. Praise is not optional. And I can bear that out in the scriptures. Praise is not optional. If you are a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, praise is not optional. Can y'all put that scripture up for me? Psalm 150. We got some Old Testament stuff going on today. Is that okay? Ah, uh, what they say right there? Come on, somebody, everybody, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's all it says. It doesn't say anything else except praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Listen to what I just read out of the Bible. He's not saying if it's okay with you and you feel up to it, praise. He said praise the Lord. It's not optional. But when you walk with him, it ain't hard either. I don't need somebody to pick a banjo for me to worship the Lord. I don't need them to play my favorite song. I don't need the temperature to be just right. I don't need people to stay out of my favorite seat nobody else sat in there and if they do my whole morning is ruined now I'm going to read this one part again praise him oh y'all ain't helping me praise him according to his excellent greatness now I want you to picture his excellent greatness and your praise should equal that if that's true what is your praise what should it look like if I'm going to praise him according to his excellent greatness what is my praise going to look like it ain't going to look like this come on does anybody believe the word Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. This is for all the quiet people that don't like all the noise. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. 
Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals, Corey. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I'm going to tell you something. You need to get all the practice you can now because the day's coming that every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess. He is Lord. Praise the Lord. Why does he need all that praise? He don't. You do. We in Psalms, let's go to Psalms 100. See, I got like paper up here. Y'all got your phones. Y'all get there quicker than me. Here we go again for the quiet people. Make a joyful shout. What kind of a shout? The joy of the Lord is my strength. I said at the beginning, life's hard, but the joy of the Lord is my strength that takes me through the hard. We're going to see in a minute that you and I are going to benefit if we'll take this word and then apply it to our life. I, I, I've thought it for years and years and years. And I'll continue to say it and think it. How we can, and it's almost football season, Corey. I mean, it's just right around the corner, baby. And it'll be stadiums full. Thousands of people. Screaming and hollering and waving flags and saying, Go Gamecocks! That was for you, Pastor. But a Gamecock ain't never did anything for me like Jesus. The Gamecocks didn't die on the cross for me. The Gamecocks didn't pull me out of the mud and the mitt and the pit and, and put me on a solid ground. Jesus did that. Come on, Jesus did that. If you know Jesus, he did that. And you mean to tell me I can't unfold my arms and say thank you? Huh? Need to figure out quick how to do that. Hmm. See, I had envisioned this great thing that when I said, worship the Lord and talk about shouting, and I just pictured the whole congregation going, yeah, woo, and clapping and y'all ain't doing nothing. Y'all are messing up my vision. Somebody needs to help me preach. You need to feel this thing on the inside. You know why? Because God is good. There's never a day that he's not good. Not just to me and not just to you, but he's good to all. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. <laughs> Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Now, I just read from the Bible. Praise is not optional. If you are a believer, praise is not optional. And I'm going to be quite frank with you. I 
I do not want to ever preach any message because Jesus said, I did not come into this world to condemn it, but that through me the world might be saved. But I do pray that the Holy Spirit will convict our hearts concerning praise. Because what I said is, He don't need your praise, you need it. And we're going to look at some more scripture, and you're going to see that, how important it is. Anytime people come in this door, and I know today there are some people in this room that are going through some hard places. Hard. But I'm trying to tell you, praise will take you through it. Praise will take you through it. Don't you let the enemy take you down. You spit in his face and you spit out of praise. I wanted to have a football with me for this illustration, but I don't. So, you have to imagine that I do have a football. Have you ever been in your walk with the Lord and you seeking the Lord and you're praising the Lord and then all of a sudden it seems like, boom! Something not good happened. While well, I was seeking the Lord, I was praising the Lord. What happened? You caught the ball. You caught the ball that the receiver, the quarterback threw? Have you ever seen a receiver uh, and he catches the ball and time he catches it, there's a defensive player that just pummels him? I mean, I see some of them legs, I'm like, that dude's dead. He, he ain't even getting up. And somehow he holds the ball and he gets up off the ground and he looks at the defender and he takes the ball and he goes, it spins that ball. That's what your praise does to the enemy. Get up and spin that ball. You caught the ball. You advanced the kingdom. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. I love coming to church and, and I love being with you guys. But the best part of my walk is when I'm alone by myself and it's just me and him and I'm talking to him. And he's talking to me. It is so precious. And when I get up from that conversation, I feel so strengthened. I feel so encouraged. I'm going to enter his courts. I come into my prayer time with thanksgiving. Everything, I've got so much to be thankful for. And you do too. If you focus on it. Or not. But I look at all the things and I, I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for parents that took me to church. Thank you that parents that walked it out in front of me the best they could. Thank you for them setting an example for me and praying for me and standing in the gap for me when I was acting a fool. 
when I was ripping up and down the road and drunk and high on cocaine. Thank you, God, that when I flipped cars and should have been dead and I'm not, Thank you that I got the greatest help me I could have ever asked for. Thank you for three awesome kids. Thank you I got a roof over my head. Thank you I'm not going hungry, y'all can tell. Then her in his court. And it just gets gooder and gooder. Life's hard. God's good. He's not telling you to do this for himself. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. You got a Bible. You got the word of the living God. You got direct communication with him. You've got the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Probably going to have to have a tissue in a minute. Ah, thank you, Lord. It says in Psalms 100 that we are, it is he who made us and not we ourselves. Thank you, Shimmer. Not we ourselves. There's certain things I say around here, and I say them quite often. Probably will continue to do that. Because I understand it's not some nicey saying that I say. It's a revelation that I have. If he don't exhale, you don't inhale. That is the truth. It's he who made us. So, I know you think I'm all that in a bag of chips, but really I'm not. He made me. He kept me. He called me. He saved me. He acquitted me. He kept me alive. He kept me out of danger. He kept me out of trouble. He met my need. He comforted me. He corrected me. He instructed me. He made me. I didn't make him. Let's go over to Psalm 71. A lot of Psalms. Did I get there before y'all? Psalm 71. I want to read 6 and 7. By you I have been upheld from birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall be continually of you. I have become as a wonder to many. Anybody in here used to have an old crowd that you hung around, you got saved and born again, now you're not around that crowd? Anybody? Anybody besides me? You know what they're doing? they wondering what happened to you. They're wondering what happened to you. Used to like that stuff. What happened? God, you have made me a wonder. Isn't that something? 
But you are my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory. When? All the day. All the day. Now, I'm fixing to go to a couple more scriptures. I'm still taking names, by the way. I want y'all to go with me real quick. No, not real quick, because I can't go there quick. Joshua. I had this mark, and then my marker fell. In Joshua 6. How are your pages turning? That means everybody don't have a phone. Praise is not optional. That's number one. Number two, praise is a weapon. In Joshua chapter 6, verse 2, And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hands, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once, then you shall do six days. Or this you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark but the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times and the priest shall blow the trumpets it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn and when you hear the sound of the trumpet that all the people shall With a okay, y'all, y'all, do y'all hear how you you saying it? What did I ask about participation, and he said, and he said, with a great shout, with a great shout, like he, it ain't in there, but it is in there. You just got to let it out. People look at me. You know what? Because you'll wonder. When you hear the sound of the trumpet that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. That's what God told Joshua to do hmm. I'm going to pick it up in 15 trying to hurry for the second time but it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner on that day only they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened when the priest blew the trumpet that Joshua said to the people, Shout for the Lord has given you... Listen, this, this is great. Shout. No, no, hold on. Shout. The walls hadn't fell yet. Shout for the Lord has given you the city. He hadn't given it to them yet. We wait till we see a manifestation, then we shout. But God said, shout before you see it. Why am I stepping on my shoestring?
Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction and it all who uh, are in it. Only Rahab, the harlot, shall live. A harlot? She and all who are with her in the house because she did hit the messengers that we sent. Hmm. I'm going to speed up for the sake of time. So, they did what God said. They blew the horns. They shouted with a great shout. The walls fell. Verse 22 says, But Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, and from there bring out the woman and all that she has as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all of her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. Praise is obedience. Praise is not optional. Praise is a weapon. Rahab, a harlot. I don't have to give you the definition of harlot, though. You mean. Surely you mean the one that went to Bible college and got the plaque on the wall and has a fantastic growing ministry. You mean her? No, I mean the harlot. (laughs) God saves broken people. Well, what did the old harlot do? She was obedient. How about that? Oh, sometimes we think our gifts and our talents and all this stuff nothing wrong with it at all but if he can save a harlot if he can save a thief on the cross that ain't never put no money in the plate didn't have a church attendance record never got babamatized Never spoke in tongues. Come on. I think we're looking for the wrong crowd. But not only Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all she had, they brought all out her relatives. You got any kids? You got any family? Come on. Obedience and praise is a weapon. Get your people in the kingdom. Obey the Lord and watch God say, okay, his mama's coming out. His father's coming out. His kids are coming out. They're not going down. Praise is more than what you think. I'm not trying to get something from you. I'm trying to get you to somewhere. I got time for one more. Go to Daniel, chapter 3. We in Daniel 3. We all know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Praise is not optional. Praise is a weapon. And praise is a witness. Nebuchadnezzar, or Nezer, however you want to say it. The king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits. And it was a big image, okay? It was this big old thing, image he made. And everybody was going to worship that image. I got to hurry up. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, uh, hey, king, we, we're not down with that. Not going to do it. Uh, king said, well, I'm very angry, and my guy's going to throw you in the fire. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I'm rushing. I got eight minutes. Or not. Oh, you king, I'm in verse 10 now. See, y'all wasn't keeping up. Oh, you king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the burning fire. And then they got told on. Uh, there's these Jews, and, and they ain't doing what you said. Well, he said, bring them to me. He corrected them, got on to them. And in 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to King O Nebuchadnezzar, We have no need to answer you in this. If that is the case, our God, who we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O King. But if not, Come on. But if not, we'll serve God if he comes through for me. Y'all no, ain't listening. I'll come to church, read my Bible, pray, and serve the Lord if he comes through for me. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Well, he didn't like that a whole lot. The Bible says the expression on his face changed. He got all contorted, bent out of shape, threw the guys in the fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, to that verse 25 said look he answered I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt hmm. in the fire and the form of the fourth is like the son of God You know, you're going to have to read this story because y'all have let me run out of time. But if you'll go ahead and finish reading the story, you're going to find out that Nebuchadnezzar was mad. He wanted everybody to worship him. These, two, these three guys said, no, we're not going to do it. He threw them in the fire. Jesus was in the fire. If you don't put me in the fire, I'll serve you. How about if you go in the fire? He said, I'll never leave you and never forsake you. I'll in no wise cast you out. But you know what happened because of that? The king said, hey, before, if you don't worship me, you're dying. Now he's saying, if y'all don't worship this God, I'm killing all of you. He changed there. It was a witness. It changed the whole nation. Praise is not optional. Praise is a weapon. And praise is a witness. On your job, in your family, they watching you in the fire. He's made you a wonder. Wonder why they ain't caving. I wonder why they ain't burning up. Most people will quit. Get your praise and give it where it's due. It's a weapon. 
I'm trying to get us to something, something beautiful. God said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I change not. That scene I painted for you, Sean, it don't change. It's going to be the same. It's not going to change. I've got to go to enjoy that view. I've got to go to it. It's not coming to me. Jesus said, this is the way. Walk ye in it. He paid the price for us. And then he said, come, follow me. You don't get out of this thing without some effort. He paid the price for my salvation. I couldn't earn that. But now, I got to shift gears. I got to get out of first and shift gears. And, and the thing is, every time you shift... Every time you shift a gear, it's less stress on the engine. Your speed picks up, and you get where you're trying to go faster. Every time you shift gear. So God is saying to us today, shift your praise. 